Hello guys, so Jerry speaking. Welcome to OJP's Reality episode number 1170. Today we get to Purple Rose episode number 93. Charles Slot Nessie, who played Dennis on Stanley. We had this beginning in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I've played Barney the Dinosaur on tour, and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now, my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind-the-scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to Purple Roads. My name is Kerry Stinson, and as always, I'm thrilled you're here. This is such an exciting week. This is someone that the fans have been wanting on this show. I've been wanting to have him on this show, and this is so exciting. This is Charles Shaughnessy, who has had this unbelievable career, and he did this part, Dennis the Goldfish, on Stanley, that you all have talked about. He won a daytime Emmy for this, and we're going to talk all about it. Charles, how are you? Hi, Carrie. I'm good. Hi, everyone. I am doing just fine. It's a beautiful sunny day here, and uh, I've got a day off work, so I'm in a good place. Mm -hmm. th these days, you're doing General Hospital? Yeah. Yeah, I started on General Hospital. When I first came out here in 1983, the first TV job, I did some stage, but the first TV job I did was a week on General Hospital, and then my career went <laughs> all over the houses, or all around the houses. And now I'm back on GH, which is really fun. Yeah, and I can't wait to talk about that because I think it's one of mm -hmm. the most interesting things about your career is that you have been mm -hmm. all over the place from soap operas to the stage, uh, voiceovers. Uh, you've done a ton of, of um, recurring roles on different shows as well. well. Yeah, it's like, you know, I, I, was, I, I constantly catch myself thinking about it and realizing how gosh darn lucky I've been, you know, mm. more so than having some long career on like maybe two big series or something, mm -hmm. to have done this kind of literally a patchwork, like a quilt mm -hmm. of, of different jobs has just been such a blessing. It's just, you know, because you're never bored. I'm just always doing something different. I think it's about being open to that. And, and I've always had my philosophy has always been when anything comes up, is there any good reason not to do it? Mm -hmm. And if there's no really good reason not to do it, then do it. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I've got to think that really builds your career, that it, a, as an actor, that really builds you up because you've done all these different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it just it exposes you to a you know always different demographics and different people, mm -hmm. and it's different experiences. And I've always thought I've always said that acting for me is about supporting my life and lifestyle. It's it's mm -hmm. I'm not one of these people who has ever said um, if I can't act, I may as well not be here. It's like that's all there is for me. Acting mm -hmm. is I loved it but it's a job and I'm very lucky to love the job I do, but it's a job that supports myself and my family and the kind of life I want to live. So uh, to have a, a, a job that takes you into all these different places and continues mm -hmm. to support my lifestyle is just, just fabulous. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it's, ama it's amazing. It's amazing because I understand that aspect um, as well. I just recently got married and I've got two teenagers and so I, I understand that, the, the balance yeah. of it. That's what it's about. I mean, it, mm. it really comes down to it for me, and I'm sure for you, it's all about that. It's all about coming home and, at mm. night or at the weekends and, and having these people that uh, you love more than life itself mm -hmm. and making, keeping them safe and happy and fed. Uh, that's what it's about. And if you can do that and enjoy it, you mm. don't have to struggle down a coal mine. Um, Boy, you know, you wake up every morning and uh, and they're just grateful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, looking, <laughs> kind of starting at the beginning, you, you were in a family. <laughs> Your parents well, were in the business, so were you kind of destined to be in Well, the <laughs> I tried hard not to be. I, I loved acting as a kid. I was in all the school plays. <laughs> Once I discovered it at the age of five, 
in Peter Rabbit. <laughs> I, wow. um, I just loved doing being uh, on stage, you know, there was nothing, it wasn't TV or film, it was just stage. Um, mm -hmm. But my parents were in it, then my brother became an actor, so I thought I better do something sensible. I, I went to Cambridge <laughs> University and read law to be a lawyer, mm -hmm. and then very quickly realized that that was just not really in the cards. So I went back to what I knew I loved mm. and uh, went back to drama school and then um, met my future wife there, went to work on stage in England, came to America and had a whole other career in America, you mm. know, starting out with stage again. I always kind of go back to stage as much as possible to sort of feed the battery, if you like. Um, mm. and, um, and things just sort of started happening. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about that with the stage because I did five years on the road with Barney. Wow. And it was the most incredible experience. There's there's nothing like that interaction with your audience. Right. That that just absolutely mm -hmm. fuels you and you you go out on that stage. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just it's amazing. It's absolutely It's amazing incredible. because and I, I I'll tell you why I why I think so I've done some thinking, I actually wrote a piece about it because there's a conspiracy uh, uh, between you on the stage and the audience out there, mm -hmm. um, a, um, uh, a suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the obvious truth is mm -hmm. there's an actor playing a part and there's an audience who have come to sort of see this actor inside mm -hmm. a costume or whatever it might be. But there's a suspension of disbelief which says, no, um, we are in, as an audience, we're in this magical place where um, this whole other universe is taking place in front of us. And we believe everything we see. We're gonna like pretend that we believe profoundly what we're seeing. And if you do that in your head, it sort of kicks in and you do. So you go to see a play and you are literally sitting there watching a family you know, have a terrible fight or you're watching someone um, uh, scared of, uh, of the guy breaking in or whatever it might be. Or in this case, you see Barney, you know, talking to you. And from the actor's point of view, you're part of that. So for mm -hmm. that time, Carrie disappears. You're Barney. And you are in this relationship with these people that's mm -hmm. kind of magical because it really lives on a plane mm -hmm. that is not reality. You're in this kind of space of meditation mm -hmm. and... And, and really sort of spiritual. It's a kind of, your, your ego and your consciousness goes mm -hmm. away, and there's Barney the Dinosaur. And it's the same with me, mm -hmm. playing a character on stage. Yes. You go away, Charles goes away, and I'm Richard III, plotting murder. And I've got mm -hmm. these co-conspirators that are the audience who are encouraging me or mm -hmm. you know, frightened of me. And it's just magical. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love that you say that, because that's exactly it. You know, it's something that I learned. I started when I was 23 years old, uh, doing doing uh, uh, performances as Barney live performances before I did the tour, and I learned that that mm. that Carrie is gone. They didn't. They they came for their favorite purple dinosaur and, right. and be able to to give that. And mm -hmm. I always I loved, and I presume you too. When you go through a show and you know there's parts mm. that the audience loves, right. It was one of my favorite things because I go, oh my God, this song's about to come up and they're going to yeah. go crazy for it, things of that nature. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's it's true. And it's and if in that moment someone mm -hmm. says, you know, oh, Carrie, it's time for, it's very disconcerting, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because you're Barney, you're, you're this purple dinosaur and you're in, rea in relationship to the kids and you're in that space and someone comes and taps you on the show and goes, mm -hmm. oh, Carrie, it's time for a break. And it's like, oh, who? <laughs> wow. It's, it's very true. I'm, I'm curious, what did you do, what do you do to get ready when you're doing a stage show? When you're, when you're getting ready to, to go out on stage, is there some way that you prepare? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I, it's um, just as a sort of slight sidebar to that, because I was doing, a, occasionally, you know, every actor gets stage fright. And I had a terrible bout of it. I was doing a play the Pasadena Playhouse, I was playing Laurence Olivier in a play called Orson's Shadow, wow. which was based on a true event when um, Orson Welles directed Laurence Olivier in The Rhinoceros at the Royal Court. Wow. And I would get terrible stage fright for it. 
and it would it would sort of build during the afternoon and into the evening mm -hmm. and i'd be sitting standing in the wings waiting for my cue and this panic would come up and mm -hmm. i would want to just pull the a, a emergency cord and get out of there um and I realized that what it was, was a panic about this transition, about, as we say, Charles is in the wing. I've been Charles, 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 Charles. And I knew that in a moment, I have to leave Charles behind and become Laurence Olivier. And there's this transition of almost feeling like Charles was gonna have to die temporarily for me to move in. So I discovered mm. that the more I, mm gradually during the last two hours put on my costume put on the makeup started to adopt the voice and started to walk in a certain way mm -hmm. and become mannered, mannered like sir lawrence and as i started to do that and my body became uncomfortable mm -hmm. and i walked into the wings as lawrence olivia so i kind of preempted it things were much easier i could then just be muttering to myself as my cue came and I sort of walk into the light, so to speak, and that transition happened. So for me, that's what I do to prepare mm -hmm. is, is um, just try to jump into that character as much as possible before mm -hmm. the actual moment arrives. Then you are kind of that transition is easy because that transition is a little terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, and the earlier you can get comfortable in a character, as we say, taking over your body, so Charles is left behind, the easier it is. So I discovered that that's what I need to do on stage. Film mm -hmm. and TV is completely different. It's complete. There is not that same moment of transition, I find. It's not quite as magical as that. It's a whole different thing. It's great fun, and I enjoy it, but it's mm -hmm. just not quite the same. But that's what I always do on stage uh, is that, is easing that transition because I know that that moment is is a pretty terrifying one. Mm -hmm. it, it's fascinating. It's really interesting because I ended up doing twelve years on Barney and Friends after doing all those years on the road, and mm -hmm. it, it was needed for for me. Um, I, you know, I started kind of losing myself a little bit, you know, living on tour buses and all of those right. things, and so being able to have a home and go to a studio and have a little bit more of a regular schedule was important. But there was an aspect of that magic that was was right. gone. Because, right. you know, once the show starts, once the live show starts, it doesn't stop. No. It, it, just, no. it goes. That's it. If you if yeah. you trip, you, you make something of it, you go up and all those things where you're doing 12 takes of it. Of a scene, right. so, right. sports, so we're working with kids. Mm -hmm. so there's right. a lot of that that's going on, and it was still an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. But it is kind of hard to explain that magic, right? Of being on stage, mm -hmm. right? It is. It's it's different. It's tiring. I mean, I've sort of now. I did something this summer. I I did uh, spam a lot um, in oh. uh, Ogunquit, Maine, which I've done before. It's a great show. Um, wow. It's a lot. It's a bit too physical for me. I'm getting to the age now where a lot of that jumping around was getting harder wow um, but i did for the first time find the eight shows a week um, wow tiring and and um and i guess because you know uh tv is is um is a bit less stressful in that way it's a let there's less demand mm -hmm. because as you say you can stop and start so um uh, I, I don't know where my relationship to stage is. It was interesting because mm. I've always loved it and I suddenly kind of, I would say I fell out of love with it, but I suddenly thought, hmm, <laughs> this mm. is getting to be a lot of work. So I don't know. We'll see. Maybe after a break and, a, you know, a nice three-hander or something, I'll mm. be up for it. But right, wow. we'll see. <laughs> so what was it like leaving England and coming to America, taking that that leap and coming into a, a totally different It different was world. a leap of faith. I mean, I had, the reason I came was this uh, woman, this girl that I met at Central, who's from Studio City, California, who came out to train as an actress in London mm -hmm. for three years, was in the year below me, and we started dating, and then she came back here to work, and I was still working at England. We kept in touch. I'd visit, she'd visit, and then after a while, I just said, you know what, this is crazy. I, I, I miss you and I want you in my life. So I proposed and she said yes. And I just packed everything up and left. 
uh, in April of 1983, and we got married in May of 1983 in Los Angeles. And wow. um, I had come out here for that, for her and for a life in America wow. with the woman I loved. The, the work, you know, I felt pretty confident that I would eventually start working, but that was not why I was here. And I think that gave me an advantage because a lot of actors, English actors at the time, were coming over for pilot season and mm -hmm. then flying back to England. And, and it sort of, there was a certain desperation. It's like, if you, if you know you're going back in five weeks, it's like, got to make it happen. Right. And from the casting point of view, they were like, well, you know, what if you just disappear again? Whereas with me, I said, no, no, I'm not going anywhere. This is home. Um, so they were able to relax and I was able to relax and eventually started working. So it was a roll of the dice. Uh, it was a huge culture shock. It's a very different cult country and a way of life. Right. But, you know, it was sunny and it was, there were the sand and the beaches and the freshly squeezed orange juice and the palm trees every time you woke up. So, you know, what the heck? It was like, you know, I saw wow. no matter how hard I was working. And I did all sorts of weird jobs at first. I was working in a textile firm. I was a private eye for a day. I was all sorts of things. But no matter how hard I worked, I always felt like I was on vacation because of the palm trees. And on Saturday, we just went down to the beach. So it wow. was actually a lot easier than I thought. And I found myself occasionally going back to England in those early years and mm. getting terribly homesick for Los Angeles almost immediately, which really surprised me. I had no idea that I was going to get homesick for Los Angeles. I thought, I maybe I'll get homesick about England. But no, mm. that was that mm. was done. Uh, it's interesting. Did So in those early days... You're, you're you're doing two different jobs. Mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to make it. Oh yeah, doing everything. Yeah. When did you start? When did it start turning? Where all of a well, sudden now doing, acting is looks well, like yeah. I make a living doing this. Well, we had in the eighties. There was a lot of what what was called um, like off off Broadway. Um, mm -hmm. um, what was it called? Um, equity non-equity or something i can't remember what they called mm. it it was like off off broadway you weren't mm. really paid anything you'd maybe get paid your parking uh, mm -hmm. money um but it was um but it was uh, an experience a way of getting mm. experience and having people see you so i was doing all these weird and wonderful jobs susan and i both mm. had these crazy jobs she was working for a music manager mm -hmm. i was working at a textile company after all sorts of other things Mm -hmm. uh, but in the evenings, we were both doing equity waiver. That's what's called equity waiver. Mm -hmm. um, and one day, I was doing this pretty dreadful show. It was a huge, long, four-hour revenge tragedy called The Spanish Tragedy. Wow. Which was a sort of precursor to Shakespeare. God knows why anyone was doing it. It was like wow. we had an audience of two every night, if that. Wow. People who just came in out of the cold, you know. Um but some casting directors from the Mark Tapers came and saw it and liked me. And to cut a long story short, six months later, they called up and said, we've got a play at the Mark Taper we'd like you to come in and see us for. And I got that. It was a new Howard Brenton play. Um, and because it was the big theater in town, I got an agent out of that. And then things started to happen. Then my agent was able to send me up for things. Mm -hmm. General Hustle came up. I went and worked at the Amundsen and one more stage thing with Alan Bates. Um, and suddenly I was kind of on the radar as mm. a young British actor in Los Angeles, and, wow. and that's when things started to come together. Mm -hmm. But it, it's interesting, because I think with your philosophy of of trying to make a living for your family, mm -hmm. it's probably easier for this next question, which is, you know, is it hard to go from, from stage and doing theater to doing a soap opera? But I think, I'm guessing, if your goal is to make a living, right. <laughs> yeah, you just don't get the same money on stage. It's just, it's true. And again, you know, I hadn't got kids by then. The kids didn't come till my first uh, girl was 1990. Um, so um, it was fine. It's just me and Susan, so stage was fine. But in 1984, 85, mm -hmm. um, Days of Our Lives came along, and I was well, doing, it was meant to be just a two or three day job. And then it sort of stretched into three or four weeks mu a month, mm -hmm. very, you know, every now and again, not a lot, mm -hmm. but a little paycheck every now and again. Mm -hmm. And then I remember it clear as day, the day my agent called and said, um, 
I think you and I think Susan should come too. We need mm -hmm. to meet. Let's go and get a drink at the Cat and the Fiddle. I've got mm -hmm. some news for you. So we went and met him and he said, they want to put you on contract. Mm -hmm. This is what it means. <clears throat> More money than I'd ever seen before. Um, wow. Or thought of. Um, and he said, now you do know a soap opera, it's a long commitment. And, you know, some people have a bit of an agenda about doing soaps, you know, blah, blah, blah. But on the yeah. other hand, this will give you some stability and mm. some financial security. So, you know, I said, yes, let's do it. And it mm. turned into eight years um, and was just great because it set, it gave me a good financial security, a base to work mm. from. We were able to buy our first house. Um, we were able to have our first child wow. while I was on days, um, you know, because it felt secure enough to do that. Um, and then after eight years, I left. I said, I've got to get out of here. Uh, otherwise, I'm here for life. Yes. And much as I love doing it, I just felt I need to, as we're saying, see some, see the rest of the world. So I left mm -hmm. and I had a year of doing not a lot, occasional um, couple of um, guest roles and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then the nanny came up. Um, out of the blue, a pilot script. And that was the next six years that allowed us to have even more financial security. We had our second child <laughs> and moved oh. to a bigger house. Um, so it was a very sort of mm. clear, nice, mm. beautifully worked progress. Mm. Wow. Um, as I say, I'm incredibly lucky it worked out like that. But yes, um, there's, and then I was able to, because I was making good money, then I could go do theater. I went and did a new play at Williamstown Theater Festival, which actually, by the time I decided my family should come to, and we rented a house for the summer, mm -hmm. um, and it ended up costing me uh, like seven or eight thousand dollars to wow. do the play. You know, far from making money, it actually right. cost me money. But I was making money, so I was able to do this wonderful play, which mm -hmm. was really exciting at Williamstown. Um, um, and then go back to the nanny, you know, the next season. So it, it works out really well. Wow. Well, obviously we want to talk about the nanny because that was a huge hit. Um, when did you realize that it... You we had realized a, it, I, 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 it was like around the second uh, season, may have been the third, second or third, um, we were in a, in a, a sort of... A, a, a fight with our rival time slot show, which was Coach. I can't remember which, I think it was ABC, we were CBS. Wow. And Coach was always winning the time slot. We were second, I think. And mm. one week, the headline on Variety was Nanny Spanks Coach. Wow. <laughs> wow. And we had beaten them. Wow. Coach. And we kind of. Wow. That was like, wow. I didn't know what they spanked coach. Like, Jesus, get to you on. That was almost like the sort of, that was the moment when we went, okay, here we go. And um, it was very exciting because it was never, it was a little show that no mm. one thought was going to go anywhere. No one knew who Fran was. No one knew who I was. Um, there were no big names. Um, mm. But the network, Jeff Sigansky, who was head of the network at the time, believed in it. And it was a really good show. I mean, we mm. knew it was really well written and a really clever idea. Um, and the audience found it in the summer reruns. They began to find it. And then they'd come back for the next season. So by season mm. three, we were off and running. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, I think a lot of it was the connection between the two of you, mm -hmm. those characters. Was that something you guys hit from the beginning? Yeah. The report well, there from the beginning? It, you know, it's funny. The story is um, that I, uh, Fran had not done very much. She'd done mm -hmm. Spinal Tap and she had a, a show wow. that didn't go anywhere called Princesses. And I had just done the soaps. That's all I had done was, was wow. the soap opera. Um, but for whatever reason, they, I, I knew, they, I found out they knew, my agent found out they really wanted me. You know, wow. It turned out it was the head of the network that really wanted me. But there's a which sort of got to be it's got to be a great feeling, which wow. is great. But I didn't know that for sure. My agents did. They weren't telling me that. All they said was, "We're not going to let you audition for this," which is the big Hollywood game. Okay. Is no, I'll take a meeting, but I won't audition because wow. I'm far too important to audition. And I like auditioning because I like them to know what they're getting. Right. Like I wow. like to know what I'm getting. Sure. So 
But my agent was very insistent, no, we don't want to let you audition for this. We want to place position you as more important than that. Mm-hmm. So I thought it's crazy because who am I? But anyway, um, so mm-hmm. I was going to take a meeting. But at the same time, it was agreed that at the meeting, maybe we would read something together because I wanted to know if it was going to work with Fran as much as they wanted to know. You know, we, we, you can't go into these things and have a surprise the first day of, of rehearsals. Right? Mm-hmm. So I took a meeting. Um, just me with the producers and Fran and we mm-hmm. chatted and we seemed to like each other and get along and then rather mm-hmm. nervously one of the producers said well you know um, we've got some sides here would you would you feel comfortable maybe reading it and I said oh absolutely let's do it so we sat mm-hmm. on the couch and we read a scene and it was kind of clear to everyone mm-hmm. in the room that we had something going you know the difference between my very British energy and her queen's energy was very funny before anyone said anything um and we were both good enough actors to know how to play off each other and so i think um when that meeting finished um we all knew that it was going to work and then it was a case of just putting the pieces together and Mm -hmm. getting the studio on board because the studio was it was made by tristar and they were like wait a minute you know who is this guy you know, wow. we need one of them to be a bit of a star name. But luckily, everyone said, no, 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 it's Fran and Charlie. And wow. then, of course, they put together this incredible cast. You then had Danny Davis, <coughs> Laura Lane, and um, uh, Renee Taylor, and just this amazing supporting mm-hmm. cast where all the chemistry worked. You know, the chemistry between Cece and Niles, the chemistry between uh, Sylvia and Niles, the chemistry between... Um, CC and Maxwell. I mean, everyone worked well together. You could put any two characters in a scene and there were sparks. Wow. So we knew it was a good formula and then it was a case of the audience finding it. But yeah, it was right from the beginning we knew we had a good show. Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's amazing how it took off. <laughs> and, and lasted. What amazes me. Wow. Is not is yes the taking off is great, but what amazes me is it's thirty years ago, and wow. still people are finding it. I hear from people who which is now four years ago, the schedule on this came out in nineteen ninety three, of names, um, it was November first, nineteen ninety three. Yeah. It would be furry in November 3rd. Okay. It was created by Friend Distressure and the uh, divorce um Peter Mark Jacobson. But you know. Um it was star Friend's friend fight and wow, I was gonna be amazed by that. It was cancelled on June twenty first, like just, just like Days before I turned uh, four in this time frame, but that's just me. Like, wow. Anyway, um, Larry got married and can say Sheffield. But anyway, and it's been on for, for about six seasons. I don't know what to do. It's just one of those best shows ever made. One of the favorite episodes I have watched is the Jeopardy episode. Where Fran was a contestant on Jeopardy, and all of a sudden she she was um, stand here in the final Jeopardy, and then say, and I was like, "Hey, I <laughs> started to laugh. Like, what is this? What is this?" Continue on. Watching it for the first time now, thirty years later, and going, "Oh my God! I've just seen this show called The Nanny, and you're in it, and it was, and it's like that was thirty years ago, and it still works." Mm-hmm. Well, I, I want to talk about that because mm-hmm. with Barney, I learned fan base. They just absolutely love it. And you, you're you on. I know that soap fans are huge. I, I know they love their soaps, and that's very important. And obviously with the nanny, and then we're going to talk about this with Dennis the Goldfish as well. Because mm-hmm. uh, I can't even tell you how many requests I got for you to be on this show. From Dennis the Goldfish. Right. And you've right. done all these other things. So right. what is it like for you understanding the responsibility to that fan base? And to, yeah. well, yes, it's a job, and yes, I'm making money, but I'm also doing something that means a lot to a lot of people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Well, again, it's sort of, I think it goes back to uh, what we were talking about at the very beginning, the magic of theatre. Because even though the making of a TV show is different as a, mm. from an actor's point of view, and it's not quite that magical connection, but once you've made it, the relationship between you on screen, which is no longer you, it's this right. avatar, and the audience watching it, once again, there's magic. Me, Charlie, is not involved in it, but Maxwell is. And Maxwell's relationship with the audience, or Shane's relationship, or the guy at Victor on GH, his relationship with the audience, is that magic. They believe, absolutely believe, that mm -hmm. Maxwell, this person I'm looking at, is in love with this woman, and they're very funny. Or this person is, you know, trying to rule the world, and he has to be stopped. So yes. I respect that. And people laugh about how soap fans in particular get you mixed up with your character and they'll stop me in the street and go Shane or they'll go, you know, Victor. And you have to go, no, no, I'm trying. And I can, but I get it. I completely understand it because from their point of view, that's the magical relationship is between mm -hmm. the character and you. So having created the character, you do have a responsibility to those fans. Mm -hmm. You can't just, dis, you know, dismiss it and dismiss mm -hmm. them, because that's really not fair. You've worked hard no. to create that relationship. Yes. You can't then go, oh, buzz off. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. so, so I do respect it, because they are responsible for building it. You mm -hmm. know, they are the people that have made Barney a, a cultural phenomenon, or made mm -hmm. Maxwell Sheffield a cultural phenomenon, and you and I are very privileged to have been part of that, um, uh, but you can't dismiss the role that they play in making that happen. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. Barney does not happen in a vacuum any more than Maxwell happens in a vacuum. So, you know, I've always been very respectful of the fans and very grateful for mm -hmm. all the things I've done um, and, and will always continue to do so. There are lines, if you're having dinner with your wife in a quiet restaurant, wow. and someone pulls up a chair and says, let me talk to you, Maxwell, I, you know, then you have to say, excuse me, but you know, right. um, not appropriate. But outside of that, if someone stops me somewhere and goes, I'm so sorry, can I get an autograph? Or do you mind taking a picture? As long as I'm not busy doing something else, absolutely. Thank well, you. Well, I mean, realize, you know, when I started realizing at the beginning, you know, for Barney, mm. it was a show that gave moms a break sometimes. It, in her, it brought... The kids and the parents closer, you know, and he's singing I Love You, A Kiss From Me To You, and the kid kisses his parent. There's a, a amazing connections in, the, in these things that I didn't think about. What, you know, when I, right. when I first got into this, I was looking for a job. You know, right. I was looking for a job. And so then you start going, well, wait a minute. And as it goes and goes, right. it's an amazing exactly. experience. And the pledge, I mean, it, it, you know, apart from the actual... You know, it's teaching certain things and it's mm. um, modeling certain behavior. Yeah. There's just the joy it brings. I mean, I I loved Barney because I just saw how much joy, pure joy, it brought to my kids. Yes. They just, you know, could, we all sang our songs. They couldn't wait to see it. You know, every birthday mm. party, it was Barney coming to the party. I mean, so just as a parent... To see your kids wide-eyed and excited and in love with um, this this character and this world mm -hmm. was just uh, you know it gave it gives the parents a a, a, a buzz too. Mm -hmm. Well, it's I, it's perfect time to go into all of this because you've we, we talked about Dennis the Goldfish. And I really want to get into that now, but you've also done several other uh, I don't want to say kids shows, but children's shows, yeah. several mm -hmm. on Disney. Uh, what yeah. is that like for you? What is that experience like? Because I love it. I, I love doing stuff for kids because they're so, um, they're innocent. They're not as jaded. You know, you don't have so many layers mm -hmm. to get through wow. to work that magic, that suspension of disbelief. They have a very vivid and working imagination right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of shortcut into those relationships. <clears throat> so I've always loved um, working uh, with and for kids, um, I, I I have to confess, I get a sort of slightly perverse mm. pleasure from doing things that scare kids. Wow. <laughs> Again, I think it's because, because there's something so sweet and vulnerable about 
being a vampire and seeing the kids come up to me and going, are you a vampire? <laughs> and I remember with my kids, you know, they were always playing dress up and they would love to do the Wizard of Oz and she, Jenny and her friend were doing the Wizard of Oz and playing all the parts and they oh. said, would you be the witch? And so I became the Wicked Witch and I scared the business wow. out of them. Um, and, and they would like burst into tears and run towards their, ran into their mummy's arms. And I, I just sat there trying not to giggle because it was so, it's so immediate, that kind of, uh, there's something so uh, wonderful about that, that such a profound suspension of disbelief mm -hmm. that they can be scared by their own dad who's pretending to be a witch. Um, so I've always loved that. I love working with, with kids and doing things. And yeah, uh, mm -hmm. Dennis was the perfect example. I mean, it was such an interesting character, this very smart, worldly mm -hmm. um, goldfish. So let's talk more about Dennis and, and that show, because like mm -hmm. I said, it, it really affected people. People love that character. And it's it, to me, it's such a fine balance when it gets into chill, children's entertainment, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with the fact of being educational, but also the entertainment mm -hmm. side of it, right? If you're just educational, educational, it, it's right. not gonna mm -hmm. work, right? You have to have that balance. And I thought, I was, I was actually going back and watching some of Dennis this morning, and wow. it's such a balance to it, because he, he's teaching a lot, he's also kind of the mentor to Stanley, right. but he's also having fun, and then, right. you know, it's out, I was watching the one with crocodiles, and it's, it's out, you know, the fantasy and the, the imagination, so there's a right. lot going on with that. There's a lot, it was a very, you know, audiences, people always talk about, you know, lowest common denominator and, oh, the audiences nowadays are not very smart, but that's not true. You give them a smart show and they absolutely get it. And and Stanley was a very smart show because it worked on these three levels. There was there was always the introduction to the show was Stanley's mm -hmm. having a problem at school or he's having a problem with his parents. There's some issue um, about bullying or about um, honesty or something like mm -hmm. that. And Dennis, in the great book of everything, mm -hmm would always find an animal, something in the animal kingdom that mirrored the issues, whether it was about um, stand, you know, being something small, but it makes itself big, again, whether in, in, in the presence of a predator, um, which would be about standing up to bullies, or there's, there's always something. So you'd learn about human behavior and how to socialize at school, and then you'd learn a bit about the animals and actually have a natural history lesson mm -hmm. and then thirdly as you say just pure entertainment because they were funny and having fun and on adventures and singing silly songs so packed into this little 20 minute seg seg segment mm -hmm. there's a wealth of uh, entertainment education and fun so yeah I, I was very aware at the time again like the nanny that this was a really good show that I didn't wow. know if people were going to find it and respond to it, but it was a, as good a show as they're going to get out there. So when people did find it, and it was a huge hit on Playhouse Disney, it was it was very rewarding. Is there a different mentality that goes in when you know your audience is completely different? You're doing this for kids compared to... No, no, I don't... Mm. Uh, not for me, no, not at all. Um, uh, no, not at all, because um, I'm very aware that as an actor, that's all I am, is a mm. big kid. We're just playing dress up. Right. I mm. mean, my youngest daughter has an incredible imagination. She's not an actress, thank goodness. But wow. I think probably could have been, um, because when she was a kid, she and her best friend, Emily, would spend all day in putting on different clothes and acting out really complex, involved scenarios about being, you know, one person's a sort of um, upper class shopper go going around a shop in Beverly Hills and the other one's the shop assistant who's mm. trying to deal with this rather diva personality. Mm. Or one's a teacher and the child is having trouble at school or one really different, different things and mm. just so real and so committed. Um, and that's all they were actors. And I and I watched them doing it, going, they're doing nothing different from what I do as a living, which is being a kid, getting in touch with your emotions and your imagination and putting on clothes and doing it. 
So when I'm doing a job as an actor, there's no different approach between mm -hmm. an adult audience or a child audience. It's exactly the same make-believe and, and conspiracy between the two of it. It's interesting, and when you're when you're doing a kid, when they they come, you get a role like this. I mean, I guess because you've done this so much, okay. you know, when you're here, you're going to be the voicing a, a a goldfish. Does it does that excite you? Because there's so many places you can go. Do you well, have, yeah. I mean, you know, well, I mean, yeah, you know, I remember, that, across. I remember that audition coming in. You know, you see, as a voice actor, you're getting all these. You know, I I do thousands, and I book like one every 10 years wow. um, and I remember this coming in and it was the voice of a goldfish um, and so I and it said you know um, it gave like 10 different actors like think you know Patrick Stewart Michael Caine wow. um, uh, Al Pacino wow. you know like what um, and it wow. said the goldfish is indeterminate age indeterminate gender um you know go so so you've got a carte blanche you know what a goldfish sounds like so i just had this idea in my head of a particular um actor that i i came to mind and so mm. i sort of did as much of a sort of imitation of him as i could um mm. and just said okay this is my idea of what this goldfish sounds like and it could have been a bazillion things. I could have done a bazillion different things. It just so happened that what I choose to put on tape, someone somewhere listened to it and went, oh, that's a goldfish. Wow. <laughs> and the rest is history. So, yeah, it was a complete shot in the dark. Um, and mm. it just so happened that we all agreed that this was what a goldfish, what, what, what Dennis would sound like. Um, and then the rest of it was just so much fun. I absolutely mm -hmm. got to love this guy. I knew who he was. Again, it's like we're talking about acting. I knew who this character was, and mm -hmm. I would enjoy walking into the studio. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I was this um, this um, goldfish, you know, who had a lot of information to impart and was rather excited to impart it. Um, mm -hmm. and a little bit pedantic at times. <laughs> wow. You know? And it was just fun. And when you're doing this, are you seeing any of the animation, or are they just recording you and then matching it up? Um, they had, like, um, they had occasionally have little sketches, as I remember. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they had a sort of sketch. So you kind of had a look at it, which is incredibly useful for me. I find when I get a voice audition and there's no sketch, I, I, it's really hard. Okay. But if there's a sketch, you can sort of see what they're getting at. Um, for the audition, there wasn't a sketch. Mm. But once I did it, um, between my voice and their ideas, they then sketched in Dennis. And once I saw him, I knew who this was. And so every now and again, they would have something, a, a particular cell on mm -hmm. it or something. But mainly, we were doing it, and mm -hmm. they were then um, drawing it. it. was going off to wherever it went, to Korea or somewhere, to, to draw it, to, to animate it. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't a lot of um, visual guidelines. Yes. We kind of set the, the pace um, in the studio. And going on a little further, do you, when you're getting this character like this, or any of these characters that you get, you know, deciding if you're going to use your voice or an accent, or how far you're going to go with that, and how quick can you decide? I mean, do you take time to think about this? What I'm going to do this, for example, with a goldfish, or um, it just come out? It's sort of. Uh... You know, you play around a little bit. As I say, if there's a picture, it's really much easier to do it. And then I play it back, looking at the picture and go, does this, is this what he sounds like? Um, and if in the picture there's certain physical things about it, like maybe there's an age or um, mm -hmm. a sort of way the mouth is shaped, it can help, you know, mm -hmm. figure it out. Do they have a lip? Do they, you know, is there an accent? Um, is it a whispery voice, you know, and then you make that decision mm. and then you kind of uh, make it real, make it become the person or the character 
Um, and it doesn't take, there's no point for me, there's no point spending too much time on it because it's got mm -hmm. a complete roll of the dice. Yeah. But once I'm satisfied that it's real, that it's not a sort of cartoon voice, okay. um, then, you know, you just, you just go for it. Um, and then the more you do it, the more real it becomes. Mm -hmm. And then on Stanley, they would then give Dennis different situations, different emotional mm -hmm. situations, um, which was great because now you're actually bringing the voice and the character into different emotional situations to see how that voice and that character works in those situations. And it sort of grows the character. And I remember the episode that actually uh, got the Emmy was one where um, he's um, leaving. He thinks mm -hmm. that Stanley doesn't love him anymore and he packs his bags and he does this Elton John song mm -hmm. um, where he's leaving and he's very emotional and very sad. Mm. Uh, and it was so much fun because I got to be mm. Dennis, who's usually very on top of things, um, mm. sort of slightly shattered <laughs> and singing. So wow. uh, it was very exciting to bring all that work and sort of develop this emotional life um, for him was, was great. What is the experience like from getting that script, auditioning for it, doing the show, and then winning an Emmy for the show. I mean, really, of all the stuff that I've done, the thing I get the Emmy for is is Dennis. God bless him. Wow. Um, and it was uh, it was shocking. I mean, it was I, I, it was genuinely I was ge you know you, they always have the speech you know I, you know I'm so surprised I wasn't expecting this. Well, I really wasn't. Um, I did have a little something written. Luckily, but I really, it was really a shock um, and, and really rewarding because you put in all the work, you know, you're kind of pleased with what you've done. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very rewarding to have that recognized. So it was, mm. it was thrilling. Uh, it really was. Um, and, uh, 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 and came out of the blue. And I, mm -hmm. I owed a lot of that to the, this, the writers and the animators because that's the weird thing about animation is, you know, again, in the speech, everyone says, you know, it's not just me, it's all the cinematographers and the director and the this. But in animation, it really is mm -hmm. you and the animators. Yes, the script writers as well, but mm -hmm. you and the animators are basically, you know, uh, it's like with Barney, it's, it's, it's the, the, the person in the costume and it's the voice and it's the the designer mm. of the of, of Barney. I mean, those three things mm. are so interrelated that you can't separate them. And it's the same <laughs> with animation. You really can't separate the voice from what they're seeing. So um, I knew they had done a great job and I was very grateful to them. But um, so I really did feel like we should be sharing this. Um, mm. uh, but it was very exciting. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting you say that because a lot of people don't understand that. that yeah, for me, it was that. I'm a voice actor as well, and so you're like one. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. For it to work, you're you're like one. You're really one, and it's and it's more true in that than anything than any other medium. So they all have their special quirks, and that's mm -hmm. certainly in animation. That's certainly one that um, you know you're, you're really one one mm -hmm. one person. We get a lot of people that watch this show that are that want to be actors and performers and puppeteers and voiceover actors and all of that. Wow. And, I, and I think it's interesting, as you were just mentioning about how many times you audition for voiceover roles and you get them here and there. I guess one, and I, I've gone through this so I understand, you know, the, the word no, or a lot of times you don't even get no, right? They just, you know, you never hear never it. Hear. <laughs> yeah, never hear. I say hear. most of the time you never hear anything. Mm -hmm. and, and, and but making that decision, right? You, you look at that script and you decide, I'm going to go with this voice and I'm going to take it this way. And if it mm -hmm. doesn't work out well, I, you know, I did yeah. that. What is that for you? Uh, for me, you know, people say, oh, there's so much rejection. It's such a tough business and that. Um, I have never taken it personally. It's weird. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. It's never bothered me. Um, it bothers me when you don't hear, when you've done a really good audition, you put it out there and no one has the courtesy to say no. Um, that annoys me. Because like with Dennis, for instance, 
I did the audition, and it was months. I mean, literally, I had completely forgotten about it. I was doing another job. I was doing a movie in Kansas, and I got a phone call. With the boss difference. Um, you... Hold on. Doing another job. I was doing a movie in Kansas. Hold on. Movie, movie and with the boss difference. Continue on. And I got a phone call, and they said, um, you booked the, goal, the Dennis the Goldfish, and I went, what? I don't even remember what that was. You know, they had to play me a tape <laughs> wow. to remind me what it sounded like. Um, and I just sort of thought, oh, they were just being rude and weren't going to get back. So wow. it's always annoying that because you can't quite let go of it right? because it might three months later suddenly come up. But it's, I never feel a personal uh, rejection. It never hurts me um, personally. It's just a profess- I'm very aware that there's a bazillion ways that they could go. There's a you know, hundred different ways that the character could be played. And they just thought, someone else's was more appropriate fine mm-hmm. you know doesn't worry me um but yeah you can put down mm-hmm. i mean literally the number of voiceovers particularly that i have thrown out into mm-hmm. the ether i mean mm-hmm. my success rate must be something like 0. 0.002 you know i mean mm-hmm. it's like the yeah, but point two got you an, an, an emmy yeah, exactly that's what's so <laughs> crazy about it i, I mean it's wow. nuts i mean literally that's the I think that's a bad and about two other shows, well, maybe three or four I've done animated, um, um, but a mm. tiny percentage of the auditions, and, and one of them's an Emmy, you know, go figure. Mm. Yeah, How Doi. have you been able to, because you've done several roles that oh, you're well known for, obviously the nanny, right. we talked about the goldfish here, obviously what you've done on the soaps. How are you, because I know you've done a lot of shows, um, as a as a as a guest yes, actor right. on, you've done a lot of those things. How are you able so that when the audience sees it, they don't think, "Oh, it's from the nanny or from the gold." Well, from yeah, that. I mean mm. that's a very good point because for a long time after the nanny, um, it was very hard to get work um, because, and I think it was probably for that reason. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, I haven't mm-hmm. had any success in the commercial world mm-hmm. um, doing. TV commercials, um, mm. and I think that's the problem. I mm. think that I'm not so well known that I can go, hi, I'm Charles Shaughnessy, and you should buy you know, this insurance policy, mm. but I'm too well known to be Mr. Everyman, so that if wow. there's a dad and his kids playing at the beach, mm. someone's going to go, wait a minute, isn't that Mr. Sheffield? You know, so um, wow. there is a problem with uh, being well known for something and then trying to do a guest spot as someone completely different and for a long time it, I believe it was an issue mm-hmm. and then I change you know and time goes by and mm-hmm. you know you can be seen as something else mm-hmm. and then if you're lucky you get um, a role that is very different like Mr. Sheffield was entirely different from Shane Donovan so for eight years I was Shane Donovan and then suddenly I was Mr. Sheffield um, mm. And then I did, after a long time, that I got to do a character, five episodes of Mad Men, as wow. uh, Sinjin Powell, who comes in and buys a company, which again was a completely different character. Mm. And a lot of people who watched Mad Men religiously, to them, I was Sinjin Powell. So wow. there's always been that challenge of creating another character that mm. you get identified for. Um, I'm at the process of that now on General Hospital. I'm playing Victor Cassidyne, the sort of evil head of the ba- a bad family who's been wow. killed like five times and come back from the dead. And this time he came back from the dead as me. Um, but again, it's like a whole other character. And at the beginning, people were writing and going, oh, to me, he's always going to be Shane, you know, or, mm-hmm. you know, oh, it's Mr. Sheffield on General Hospital. And gradually that's got less and less. That noise has lessened. And people are like, no, no, that's Victor Cassidy now. So wow. it's very, it's very gratifying to sort of be mm. able to shed one skin and put the other one on and have people accept it. Mm-hmm. But it's not easy. It's it not takes easy. Takes no. time and patience because mm. you, as a, going back to what we're saying, this is the theme of our conversation. The magic that you create with the audience, mm. this suspension of disbelief, is so important and so real. They feel a slight betrayal if suddenly you're not that person anymore. 
Um, it's a bit like you dump them um, to someone else, yeah. um, but then they kind of you allow them to mm. fall in love with the new the new boyfriend. You know? Wow! Um, but there's a there's a moment of betrayal, you know, wow. when suddenly their beloved Shane Donovan is being funny with Fran Drescher. It's like where does that come from? Wow. Or being Sinjin Powell or being you know evil as Victor Cassadine. So it's again part of the fascination of our business, you know, mm -hmm. which is this this um, you know creation of uh, magical creatures. Is it? So we'll talk about Victor here for a second. If okay, so you you go you you start doing it, but as you continue and you start really getting into the character, and I'm guessing that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. you get to know it. You know, obviously, when I first got it, you named Barney. To after I had been doing it for all those years, it's a completely different. You really understand the character and the audience, right. all of that. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah, that, absolutely. It, as you and, really and get to know that character, grow you get to it. know the character. And sometimes uh, a new writer will come on the show, or a new director will come on the show and say, you know, and then you do this, you move over there, and you do this, and you know better than anyone no 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 i can't barney and, and sometimes people go oh you're being such a diva you know what are you talking about you, you know it's, it's a mm -hmm. you're a purple dinosaur you don't know what the purple dinosaur. you go no i do i know barney would not do that no this would is not in his being mm -hmm. he can do this but he can't do that yeah and sometimes they'll push back and sometimes you have to dig your feet in and go no i the actor for that moment, if you make me do this, for that little moment, I'm breaking the magic because I'm no longer believing I'm the dinosaur because I know I wouldn't be doing it. So I'll do it if you want, but I'm telling you, you're breaking this bond of trust mm -hmm. with the audience because they know and I know I wouldn't be doing it. So mm -hmm. as you're developing a character, um, and, and on GH, they're great because they listen and they watch they see what you're doing and, and, and they get really in tune with what you're developing mm -hmm. and they're very easy. If I say I wouldn't do this, they're like, okay, fine, whatever you think, you know, you tell us. Yes. So there's a great deal of trust. But it's true. As you develop the character with the writers and with the directors, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're right. Sometimes they say, well, try it. And you try and you go, oh, you know what? I get it. I see what you mean. Yes, that works. Um, and out of that, you, you build a more and more real more and more flesh and blood character. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I did run into some of the what you're talking about. And one of the hard parts we had is that the songs were so beloved. Mm -hmm. But when you've done it, you know, 10,000 times, there's a new director, someone comes in and says, you know, let's mm -hmm. give that song a break. And it's like, we can't. No. Right? You know, we can do a different mm -hmm. version of it. And that's what right. ended up happening, right? You, you do a different style of music to that song or a different right. dance step or something like that. But mm -hmm. you have got to always remember your audience. Right. You've got to remember mm -hmm. the audience and you've yes. got to remember who the character is. Like, you know, you established Barney um, and and how he uh, dances, for instance. You know, and he has those sort of certain movements. And I remember Barney would do twirls occasionally. But they were sort of, it was obviously limited by the costume. But there was also, he's a dinosaur. He's big. He's like... You know, there's a certain kind of weight involved. And if a director had said, listen, this is all getting a bit old-fashioned, we want to sort of jazz it up and have Barney do a kind of um, urban dance, <laughs> you know, you would say, if I'm going to do it, he's going to do it badly. You know, wow. it's, going to be, it's going to be funny because he's going to fall over. No, 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 because the kids love it. And they, they, I think he should be really good at it. And you go, no, that's crazy. Barney cannot do the frog well, whatever it might be, it's just not going to work. He right. can do it badly because he's trying and it's a joke and they all end up on the floor laughing. But mm -hmm. don't ask me to do something that just because you think it needs to be updated completely goes against what we've established this character as. Yes. So it's, it's so funny because it is, it's exactly, and it is, it's, I learned that, and I think I learned it from doing the stage show for so long. Mm-hmm. Because that's where you're really in tune with your, right. your audience. You know, the songs that they love and the things of that nature. So, right. So, hey, I want to wrap up with what's next. Obviously, you're going to be with GNH for a while. But GNH, yeah. And you know what? Who knows? I mean, this is the great thing about this business, as you know. You know, I mean, people say, what, what role would you like to do? Or 
what would you like to be doing next or what is next? The joy of it is I have no idea. I mean, if you had told me at the beginning of my career any one of the different moves that have come mm. from doing a soap opera to doing a sitcom to doing a, a, a beloved ca cartoon fish, any of it, mm. you know, I'd have said you're crazy. So I've learned not to predict, not to expect, but to enjoy whatever comes down the pipe, you know. Mm. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to likewise, you. Likewise, likewise. I always, uh, mm. it's been a real pleasure, Kerry. I, I, and it's mm. such a pleasure to meet you and talk with you. You know, you, as I say, you've been a part of our lives in this household for a, a, a long time. And my kids still, you know, talk lovingly about Barney. Well, um, well I have, I watched the nanny. I've, I've seen you many times in all the different things you've done. Mm. And I'm very impressed because being in this industry, I know how difficult it is to have a career that you've had and as diverse a career as you've had. And uh, hearing these stories behind it's just been a joy. Likewise, mm. great fun. It's been a really fun morning. So the time has flown by. Well, thank you so much for joining me. All right, you take care. Bye now. Bye. And thank you for watching Purple Roads. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and your heart open and you'll find your Purple Road. We'll see you next week. So that was... Um... Purple Rose, episode 93, Charles um, S., whatever, from Stanley. What did I say about this episode? Boy, it was amazing. So far, this episode was a success. Hold on. What do you say? We can't hear a thing. Okay, whatever. <sighs> that was up with LJP3 as episode number. Uh, 1,170. Um, this is getting ridiculous on Carrie's part. Hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned for the next one, which is going to be LJP3 as episode number. 1,000. Um, one hundred and um, um, seventy-one, which would be about the brothers uh, thing. LGB ads episode number one thousand one seventy-one, something like that. Purple Rose episode ninety-four. Now, man, excuse me, I gotta call, call Remix. Talk to my mom. We're gonna be going to a new family dollar. So there you go. Till next time. So Jones and Papa, so baby, good one, Dries. Got me soon. To it out. See ya. time I failed to really understand it. I never sought to meet the maker of reality. The one who gave the life that which is always happening. But I tried all the time. Was I the one to see things as I do under the moonlight and the sun? Perception is the question and the giver holds the key.